Hello, I'm Richard with ev for You Custom Conversions. And this video is going to be a little different in that what I'm going to show you in this video, only the first minute was planned. Everything else <laughs> was not planned and not expected. So let's take a look. Hello, this is Richard, ev for You Custom Versions. Hey, I just got back from about a 40-minute drive in the Doka. Um, motor temperature, it just dropped down from 73 to 72. I forget, forgot to hit the record button, <laughs> so I talked for a minute or two. <laughs> anyway, that's the motor temperature after driving this 4,000-pound Doka in a 111 degrees Fahrenheit day. Nice and hot. The batteries love the heat. This thing's really got zippy doodah in the summer compared to the winter. And um, we're pulling about 2.9 amps um, with the cooling fans and pump and the DC to DC converter running. And let's take a look at um, controller temps 51. It was running between 49 and 51. I just pulled a grade. Anyway, 40 miles at between 40 and 50 miles per hour with stops, you know, stop and go. In other words, a country driving, hilly terrain, um, a stop every couple miles, and then accelerate. So it wasn't like they were just cruising. So. And we just got a code 39. Don't know what that is. Never seen that before. Well, let me look it up and see what that is. So of course, as you can see, I was just doing a short little video just to show, you know, how the Doka handles the heat that we have here. We've driven that vehicle in 118 degrees on multiple times. Uh, it's not unusual for us to have weeks of 110 plus degrees um, and so and we have months of 100 plus degrees so you know the heat is something that uh, that we deal with a lot and so the reason I want to show this is the doke is a little different and one is that it's a rear engine rear wheel drive vehicle that has very poor cooling even amongst the Volkswagens, it's probably one of the worst as far as getting cool air into the uh, engine compartment because it was originally a liquid-cooled uh, engine. And so it had a radiator in the front and it depended on you know, coolant to keep the engine at the proper temperature. And so what air ducting it does have is to allow air to leave that compartment. Uh, so I wanted to show, uh, you know, the controller temperatures. Uh, this setup is the same when I run on my own personal cars, uh, like the Carmagia and the Bug. And, uh, and we did a lot of this on the Porsches also. So what we have is we have a cooler and a radiator. So the coolant's going to come from your, your reservoir through your pump through the chill plate on the back of the controller. Then it goes through a cooler, like a transmission cooler type of thing. And, and that we have in an airflow somewhere, typically right underneath the vehicle somewhere where we're catching a little bit of airflow, but not you know, exposing it to road hazards. Um, and then it goes through a radiator that has fans and then returns to that reservoir. And so this one's got an, it actually has a larger uh, reservoir than what we, not reservoir, yeah, radiator. has a larger radiator and reservoir than we normally use on the vehicles. It has the, the, the original overflow um, reservoir is what we're using on this one. So anyway, all of that was to keep this thing cool because the original customer lived in the Mojave Desert in the middle of nowhere. 
And then the other thing that's kind of interesting about this one is it has a non-vented motor. And so this is a three-phase AC induction motor, and most of the high-performance electric vehicle systems motors uh, that were used in on-road vehicles were vented and fan-cooled. So they had an internal fan. This one does not. And I always assume that's why they discontinued the AC-75 and the AC-76 was that, you know, they had other offerings that you could use that did a better job of cooling. But we chose this one for this vehicle because the guy lived in the desert, he was going to be driving in the sand, uh, even driving on the road, you're driving in the sand a lot of times if the sand blows and so forth. So we wanted the sealed motor, and the other was it best replicated the internal combustion setup. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is 90 horsepower and 189 pound-feet of torque, which same horsepower, I think, is what the 2.1 liter uh, advertised was at 90 horsepower, but I believe this electric motor puts out more torque than it did. Uh, I can tell you it drives better than the original one because I drove the vehicle with the original 2.1 liter in it and actually drove it uh, about 70 miles up to the foothills and then back. And so I had a little bit of experience of what it felt like uh, before conversion. So anyway, that was why I took this little video with my cell phone. And the funny thing was I, I pulled up in front of my house, but uh, I'm, you know, 120 feet from my garage. And, and my house sits above the road, so I had to go up. <laughs> and so I don't normally use my phone to video things very often. So I'm, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm talking, as you'll see in a moment. But the first time, I forgot to hit record. I switched it from, from you know, still photography to video, but I forgot to hit record. <laughs> then I noticed I hadn't hit record, and I did the whole thing over a second time. So things hadn't started off too well. A little uh, backstory I already kind of hit on it. Uh, we originally converted this vehicle for a customer who's down in the Mojave Desert. We converted it. Wow, I turned around and realized I had a typo here. <laughs> I really do know how to spell. Just can't prove it sometimes. <laughs> it was originally converted for a customer in 2013. And uh, it was a little different job, and I've explained all that in other videos. Like I said, we did a series in 2013 covering the entire conversion. You can go back and watch that if you want to know more. It features the high performance uh, electric vehicle systems AC75 that I was just talking about and the Curtis 1238 uh, controller and it's a 22.6 kilowatt hour pack. I believe the nominal voltage on this is like 125 volts. Um, it spent eight years in the Mojave Desert it was driven for a year, the first year it was down there, and then it sat for seven. And we did a, a couple of videos on the batteries and testing the batteries after they were, you know, sat eight years in the Mojave Desert, seven years where they just sat and weren't touched. And you want to know how good these calp cells are? I can, I can, I can testify. Not only do we put them in all of our conversions, and we've done a lot of conversions, but this was the ultimate in that these sat in the extremes, not in a garage, out in the open Mojave Desert. And they're still on the road to this day. And uh, it was gifted to us in 2021. So we converted for a customer, spends eight years in the Mojave Desert, comes up to Northern California in 2021, and it is driven every day. And we drive the snot out of it. It's driven in the snow. We've driven it, you know, 118 degrees, as I mentioned earlier, multiple times. It, it's in the one teens all the time. And the car drives great. The, heat, the batteries love the heat. Um, that motor shouldn't, but it amazingly does the job well. Um, 
I've seen it get up to 80, you know, degrees Celsius before, but it, it doesn't tend to get much hotter than that. And, and we've seen, you know, some of the AC 35 times two, you know, get much hotter than that. Um, so it's doing a, a great job. Um, and so now that you kind of have a little of the background and why I was doing what I was doing, now let's talk about what, you know, what did we do to rectify this problem? And we're going to start off with, you know, it showed a code 39. Well, what the heck's a code 39? Well, if you look up the error codes for the Curtis, um, error code 39 is the main contactor did not close. Main contactor did not close. Main contactor tips are oxidized, burned, or not making good contact. External load on capacitor bank you know, blown V plus fuse to clear, you cycle the KSI. Well, let's talk a little more about all that. So, those uh, items really didn't make any sense to me. I mean, they would in a different scenario, but you could see the, <laughs> the vehicle was on. I had just driven it for 40 minutes and while I'm doing this video bam the contactor opened up and once it did that it gave that code 39 so you know first thing you do is you know is you, you turn off the ignition wait a moment turn it back on and see if it's going to reset itself or you've got a problem I did some troubleshooting, and what I'm going to do is we'll uh, open up the back end of the Doka, and we'll take a look, and we'll make it a little more interesting. You can see things instead of looking at my mug. There you can see the main contactor. It's mounted on the side of the engine bay there. There's the controller. There's a coolant reservoir, kind of our relay board. But anyway, the main disconnect switch. So, first thing I did was I checked the voltage, and you can see, you know, one side of that controller is coming directly from our disconnect switch, which is coming directly from the most positive point in the battery pack. So. Anyway, check for voltage there, then check for voltage on the other side of the contactor, and that's with the ignition on, and of course there was nothing. And, um, you know, I knew that without testing it because my JLD404 told me that I had, had power, and uh, it's taking power off that one side of that contactor also. So anyway, Next thing we did was we checked to see if there's power to the coil of the main contactor. And there was not. Which was my assumption, you know, almost immediately, is that the power supply in the controller failed. Because the power for that contactor comes from the controller. And so once you, you know, uh, turn on the ignition and your, um, your key switch relay closes uh, on this, on the 1238, they run off traction pack KSI signal. And so once that relay closes, you get traction pack voltage to the controller, it comes on, and then it tells the contactor to come on. Well that failed. You know, we checked all the wiring all the way back and so for some reason that power supply failed. So this is a 24 volt contactor and so what I did was uh, I disconnected the those two coil connections there and then 
um, and you can see I made a little sharpie mark there that's the negative and the one on the left is the positive and I uh, took a, a, a little 12 volt battery that I have a little uh, lipo 4 battery I keep on my workbench for testing and stuff grabbed it and a couple jumper leads and checked it and thunk to thunk and you know that contactor is sounded nice and strong it's operating great on 12 volts so what I did then was I took one jumper to ground and I took the other one over here to the uh, fuse block right here and I just went to the supply terminal there for that fuse block and that allowed me to you know pull the thing into the garage for the night and then the next day um, I, I made some phone calls nobody seemed to know any more about this than I did <laughs> I'm assuming there's a, a, a couple second delay I'm assuming that the the capacitors in here are, are pre-charged by the uh, KSI input signal and uh, anyway and then the contactor you know uh, is closed once those caps are charged so you know do I put in a, a delay circuit uh, I, I what I've done before instead of coming up with a delay circuit what we've done is we put a separate switch in so you turn on the ignition and then we put in a, a, a momentary push button switch with a um, um, latching relay setup so that you push that as like, kind of like a start button. You press that button and it latches a relay that then, you know, closes uh, or supplies the 12 volts to this contactor. And so that's what I did in this case. Uh, you know, I've tested it, been driven it for several days now. It's working fine. So uh, now, is that going to be a long-term problem or not? I really don't know. Um, and so, and, and people I've talked to that supposedly know more about this than I do, couldn't answer that question either. So it's, it's working fine. Um, I do have another contactor that's a 12 volt coil contactor that I, you know, with the same specs as this one, except for it's 12 volt, but this is working fine. So why tear everything apart and, 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 and do anything different? So. Um, but anyway, this engine compartment is pretty dirty and nasty. Um, you know, a bunch of that wiring or anything down there um, that's all taped up. That's the original wiring for the fuel injected setup. I didn't want to cut all that out because you never know where this will end up and somebody may want to go back to the stock setup. I don't know. So it's a lot easier if you've got all the wire and you know, that wiring harness for the fuel injection and all that's intact. So, this is not a show car by any means. Um, this thing I said sat in the desert for eight years. We've been driving it for a few years. I've never cleaned this engine bay. It's just the way it is. <laughs> it's, it's nice and dirty. Um, but it runs like a million dollars. It's, uh, it's actually the most driven vehicle I own. We drive this snot out of this thing. So I was glad that we were able to, you know, make that quick and easy repair and get it back on the road. And uh, I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, my sharing this with you. And uh, I hope you uh, will like and subscribe. And hope to see you next time.